Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another incredible session of The Crave Show. This is Kenny, the wine czar, number one rated from the state of Texas, and I'm here with my good friends and co-hosts in Utah. Big Joe, Anger Joe, say yeah. hello. Yeah, woo, woo, woo. How's okay, it going, y'all? I, yeah, you hey, can Joe. Tell he's been hitting the, hit the bourbon early this morning. No way. Problem. Don't tell anyone. Don't let anyone know. No, this no, is sure. just coffee. I promise. Okay, sure. <laughs> oh, the Irish coffee. And yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. The main reason we're here today, the man, the myth, the legend, the king of all restaurants. <laughs> the myth. Steve, the man Doyle. Steve, say hello hey, to everybody. Brother. Hey, brother. How you doing, man? Yeah. I'm in Utah yeah. also. So um, uh, we have a lot in common here, uh, Joe. Yes, we do. <laughs> Yes, we do. Beautiful. We have Beautiful. a great show lined up, don't we, Kenny? Uh, an amazing show. Uh, we have a, a very special guest and one of the most incredible chefs in the country, if not the world. Uh, he's the godfather of Southwestern cuisine. He's had so many different restaurants and concepts that are all amazing. Stephen Piles will be with us today. And uh, our uh, other co-host is on a field assignment, Lisa, the tornado from Plano, Delano. Uh, she'll be uh, on the show a little bit later with a really cool wine segment. So look forward to that, and uh, let's kick it off. Steve, tell us what's going on in the world today. Well, uh, we have a lot going on uh, if you're into viruses, but if not, um, <laughs> there's more virus talk. Uh, we saw the Hillstone uh, back down on their um, no mask uh, PPE uh, situation, and uh, they had a lot of furor from around the world, actually. And uh, so they backed down this week and allowed uh, their workers to wear a mask, which is pretty neat. Um, I'm not sure how you sit on this, Ken uh, and Joe, but uh, you know, masks I think are pretty important right now. If nothing else, it, it uh, lends some uh, some security to clients. And I think that's important. I, yeah. I, 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 go ahead, Joe. Uh, well, I was just going to say I think uh, – there's some people out there who are definitely still a bit cautious about wanting to be out and about. So if, I mean, if you're serious about making sure people, your customers feel comfortable about coming into your spot, I mean, why, why not? It sucks to wear, to have to wear them while you're working. But uh, yeah, it, I just think it's that extra little buffer that shows that, yeah, we, we are being cautious and cognizant of all this stuff. What, what were you going to say, Kenny? Well, I was going to say, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of people in the medical community have basically said the wearing of the masks is a waste of time. It's really not going to protect you uh, unless we went out with gloves, a full medical gown and masks. Uh, it's the only way. One thing we know this virus lives on the surface for a long time. Uh, so just just a mask. And most of these masks that people are wearing are bandanas, T-shirts. I've seen every kind of mask you can imagine. They're not going to protect us. Uh, I don't want to go to a fine dining restaurant and have everybody wearing masks. It's just weird. Uh, I'd rather stay home. So that's my opinion. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy. And at the same time, if people feel that it keeps us safe, let's get through the next two months and see if, uh, you know, the virus starts to subside in the summer when most viruses tend to disappear. So right. I've sort of got mixed feelings on it, but uh, I'm not down with wearing masks. All right. That's our COVID talk for today. That's it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you know, Steve, I, I actually, uh, not that I really want to get into this virus thing, but, uh, you know, as you know, I spent half my life in Las Vegas and uh, I've been watching what's happened in Vegas. And I've got a lot of friends in the casino industry as well as the restaurant industry out there. And Las Vegas could be the first city that goes bankrupt really? due to this outbreak. And, um, uh, you know, what people don't realize is that uh, they are going to open up the first week of June, just a few properties, but they've got to hit a 50% occupancy and a lot of restaurants will not open. And think about all the things why people go to Vegas, pools, parties, strip clubs, nightclubs, uh, concerts, all gone, even sporting events, gone. So there's not what's, a lot what's my motivation there. to go to Vegas then? Well, correct. You know, uh, outside of if you're a sick, maniacal gambler, and I don't know any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. That's me. Uh, and and uh, so, uh, so the city, you know, they make a living off conventions, right? Uh, right. You know, and, and if they don't hit a 50% occupancy, they can't operate the casino. And without those conventions, it'll be very tough. Plus, people are afraid to fly. So only people who I think will come in will people who, who can drive, you know, by auto. And that's a limited market. Uh, so it's going to be real interesting watching Las Vegas. I will be there the first week of June. The Bellagio's opening. It's my second home. 
and we'll see, we'll see what it's like. But I mean, they've got so many weird rules about masks, no congregating at a table, no more than two people at a table. Uh, I just don't see how it works, but uh, we'll stay tuned and uh, they'll have at least one or two good restaurants there. So right. and I think you're going to be talking about uh, Vegas restaurants today, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I got, uh, you know, a couple of restaurants I'd like to talk about real briefly. Um, and, and again, these are both in the Bellagio, my uh, favorite place on the planet. Um, the first one is called Sedell's. And for those of you who do not know, Sedell's is a famous, famous Jewish deli out of New York. Uh, but it's a high-end deli. Uh, and what they did in the Bellagio, they took over the old cafe, which is just, you know, like the worst place on the planet, quite frankly. Uh, and okay. they metamorphed it into this beautiful space. Uh, the service is impeccable. Everything they do is top shelf. It's not cheap, uh, but you get high quality food. A couple of things that I love there, they're famous for the salami and eggs. Why? Don't ask me. It's just amazing. <laughs> Have it when you're there. And if you're uh, health conscious, they're actually the healthy egg sandwich with arugula and green chilies and egg whites, phenomenal. The French toast is like nothing you've ever had. Fre all fresh squeezed juices. Uh, what, really what's the deal with the French toast? What, what yeah, it got me uh, picked on that one. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a giant <laughs> piece of brioche be, uh, bread, and it's soaked in this egg custard and grilled to perfection with maple syrup and the cinnamon butter that they put on there. It is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, mm. It's one of the highlights. Uh, I like everything in Vegas. So everything's over the top. Yeah, but if you eat that French toast, you got to go back and take a nap. Uh, they also do uh, dinner and lunch, and it's really weird. I've, I've only been there for lunch. Uh, two things that, that stepped out. The fried chicken is actually really, really good. Uh, and the fish tacos, which doesn't make sense for a Jewish deli from New York. Uh, I never grew up eating fish tacos. I don't even know what they were. But they're on the menu, and they are amazing. Uh, and now I'm going to move on to my favorite new place. One of the things you see in Vegas, casinos are constantly flipping restaurants. They got to bring new restaurants in, new chefs, new concepts. But finally, finally, a casino woke up and said, what is Vegas? Vegas was the Rat Pack. Sammy, Dean, right? right. Uh, Frank. And they opened up a restaurant called the Mayfair. And this is a throwback to the Cotton Club. It's a 1940s supper club. The entertainment is absolutely incredible. All tribute to the Rat Pack music. They got an amazing five-piece band. They have one guy who sings like Frank and Dean. Then they have a woman who comes on and does Etta James. You would swear Etta James is in the room. That's, that's insane. Ooh. It is spectacular. The sound system is impeccable. They also have people walking around mm -hmm. in costumes and they have people doing aerial high wire acts. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely incredible. The food is old school Americana Supper Club. Uh, it's really good. Tableside Caesar. All the servers, by the way, uh, are veterans. You know, they've probably been around 20, 30 years serving tables. So it's a very efficient, great old school service. The entrees that I love, uh, the prime rib and Branzino, good. But the two specials, Beef Wellington, off the hook, lobster mm -hmm. thermidor, amazing. Right. And then for dessert, Baked Alaska. All those throwback dishes. So, yeah, it is such an experience to go there. That's what Vegas was built on when this thing started, courtesy of Bugsy Siegel. And the Bellagio finally figured it out. They carried on the tradition. There's no place in Vegas like it. No matter what you do when you go there, go to the Mayfair. It's worth it's worth the experience. Mayfair. That's that's, that's exactly what I want. That's when I when I think about Vegas, I think about supper clubs. I think about a floor show. I think about 1940 movie. Where I'm in it, and that's 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 fantastic. Is everything yeah. in black and white there, or is it? Do they have color? No. Uh, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I mean the bar is incredible, a stained glass like you've never seen. The room is impeccable, they, and it's done like in levels, so it's almost like you're at a at like at a dinner theater, and and you have these incredible comfortable booths. You've got some tables closer to the stage, but the booths are where you want to sit in the back of the restaurant. It's not an overly large place but it's just intimate enough and, and there's no bad seats in the house and the music is loud, loud enough, but not so loud that you still can't have a conversation at dinner. Uh, like I right. said, uh, it's my favorite place in Vegas uh, for the overall experience. And no matter what, you're in Vegas, go to the Mayfair. Tell them uh, the wine czar sent you. Right. Yeah. Well, that's okay. fantastic.
What do, what do you like about the Bellagio so much, Kenny? Uh, we never lose there, Joe. That's uh, the main thing. <laughs> oh! You know, uh, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I mean look, uh, you know, without sounding like a snob, there are uh, only three casinos that I would ever consider staying in, uh, uh, which is the Wynn, okay, impeccable, beautiful, high-end, classy. Uh, the Venetian, which I really like as well. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Bellagio. Uh, everything else caters to a different... Uh, you know, class of people like the Aria is absolutely beautiful, but it's a younger crowd. Uh, the MGM, it's like if uh, you went to Lake Havasu and then you went to a casino, uh, that's who you'd see there at uh, the MGM. Uh, and there's good restaurants in all the casinos, you know, and they have different price points, obviously, right? So the different price points cater to different people. But for me personally, uh, you know, the Bellagio is where me and Big Johnny stay. Uh, we're there every other weekend. Uh, of course, you know, the red carpet is for us. Uh, you know, we get everything comped. And uh, it's Man. just, for me, it's, it's the place to be. Uh, Wait, we know all the people me... who work there. When are you going to let me come along? And I, I want to come along and, like, carry your luggage or something, man. When, when are you going to well, let me tag along? Here's the best <laughs> part. Because, you know, we, we, we play in a high limit room, right? Yeah. So, like, afterwards, <laughs> uh, we, you know, at, at the bar, just wines by the glass. We're either drinking Cayman Special Select or Bhutan. Uh, you know, first growth Bordeaux. Uh, uh, sometimes I'll just have uh, Pappy Van Winkle on the rocks, uh, and there is no limit to uh, what we drink and what we eat, uh, and it's all taken care of. Uh, so it's amazing, you know. Uh, but uh, the, the Bellagio just does it right. They always have. And, you know, now that we've been there for the last two years, as much as we've been, we know all the people who work there. Everybody knows us. And, we, you know, I mean, we walk into half the restaurants and the red carpet gets rolled out. So it's a lot of fun. It's great. Amazing food, amazing wine. And uh, listen, we love the action. That's who we are. Yeah, that sounds so fun. Sounds good. You know, oh, uh, there's, there's a supper too. Can't talk. Speaking of supper clubs, um, the Clover Club in Dallas um, is much like what you're talking about. And that's owned by uh, uh, Lucky, the bartender, Lucky. <laughs> right. And he, he runs that uh, along with Brad Away. So okay. it's a really fantastic situation. They have a nice uh, rooftop. Uh, casual atmosphere, but down below, um, it's all like uh, first class uh, shows all day, all night, and um, great, great food. It's pretty fantastic, though. Yeah, you know, unfor unfortunately, there's not, a, there's not a lot of places like that left in the country. So I'm glad to not. hear uh, that Brad and Lucky have put something together like that in Dallas. And, right. you know, people think, uh, you know, Dallas is just another city in Texas, but Dallas is a really cool, sophisticated uh, city and uh, during my time there, uh, amazing people, uh, sophisticated taste, and you know I think there's certain markets where that supper club, you know, Rat Pack, jazzy kind of shows plays really, really well. And I'm really shocked in all of Los Angeles, there's not a place like that. There's a couple of right. jazz clubs, but the food is so bad, you know, you're just like, there's no way I have to eat this crap to listen to right. my favorite uh, jazz musicians. Uh, but when they do it right with food, cocktails. And entertainment it's magical yeah brad and lucky both called me and told me they were all excited about the the, the clover club yeah we have a um super club coming like well that's probably not right you know it's probably not going to be what i think it's going to be um there's been some other restaurants in dallas that are still in existence that uh claim to be a supper club that just have like a little platform off into the corner and they play some light jazz or whatever at at uh at night and uh, it's not, not a supper club. That's not what it is. We're talking about big four right. shows. We're talking about, you know, some good entertainment. We're talking about you know, some seriously good music and, and great food. And yeah. that, that, and the atmosphere, that's a supper club. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, I think the other thing, the Mayfair put a dress code. Uh, you got to wear a jacket. Yes. And, uh, you know, I absolutely love that. I can't tell you how many times I've been to really high-end restaurants and in, in other casinos in Vegas. And, the guys next to us are wearing flip-flops, a baseball cap, shorts, and a T-shirt. And it's like, okay, how, I mean, how do you let these people in, you know, right. dress like that? It's just ridiculous. And I get it. Vegas has become casual. It's become – The whole world's become know, casual. And uh, yeah. I, I miss, you know, wearing a jacket, you know. And right. Now, now you look like a you – know, you stand out. Yeah. I mean, when uh, me and Big Johnny uh, at the Bellagio, when we gamble, and we only gamble from 12 noon until 5 at, at night, because uh, you know we want to stay on point. Is that all? We wear, we wear jackets. <laughs> we are dressed to the nines, right. and that's just our routine, man. We're two guys from New York, and, and we believe that's how it should be done. 
and not sitting there in sweats and a baseball cap. Uh, so we get dressed up, and, and that's just the way we roll. And I think uh, the Mayfair is the first step in bringing some of that back. And I it's like cool. That. I mean, you know, really if, cool. if Vegas does fall, uh, it will return, and it will return probably, hopefully, with, with a, different, a different atmosphere. Um, it's become very f- uh, family friendly. Um, I'd see it kind of segregate a little bit. And yeah, that, that's, well, that's a good step. It, it is, but the problem they're going to have is uh, June, first week of June, they're going to open up, uh, the MGM group is going to open up two casinos. Uh, Bellagio's one of them, and probably the MGM. And then they have to see how they do, how the crowds come. Uh, the women's going to open, and the Venetian, I think, is going to open, uh, right. and probably Caesars. And uh, so, you know, small offering. They'll have to obviously monitor the uh, occupancy rate. Summer's a weird time in Vegas, especially with no conventions. You know, a lot of people, it's too hot for people to come. Plus, uh, like I said before, nobody's flying right now. Uh, it'll be real interesting. And if, the, and if the virus comes back in the fall, Vegas is in real deep trouble. I mean, well, we're all, all in trouble. You know, I mean, it's 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 scary what could happen. So, uh, like I said, I I believe it could be as bad as the first bankrupt city uh, in the country. And uh, right. <clears throat> losing Vegas, I uh, I think I'll just uh, you jump off a pier and try to swim to China. That's it for me. <laughs> okay, real good. Um, okay, well, the next segment we have coming up, uh, we're going to be talking to Stephen Piles, uh, the world famous chef and friend of ours. And we're back, guys. Uh, we have Stephen Biles coming on this segment. And uh, you know Stephen Biles from as many restaurants, such as Ruth Street Cafe, Baby Ruth, uh, his eponymous restaurant, Stephen Piles, Star Canyon, San P66, and Flora Cafe, which just closed. And uh, we're going to talk to him about that and many, many more things. Um, let's have Stephen Piles. And we have Stephen Piles with us now. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Chef. Stephen, how are you? Nice to be here. Doing really well. I haven't seen you in quite a while, and I guess uh, some of that's uh, virus related. We don't want to talk about that too much because it's kind of a downer, I guess. But uh, how are you? How are you feeling these days? You know, I'm feeling good. Um, it was such a shock uh, going into this, and uh, I said I was uh, at ground zero a couple times. I was I was on the last flight back from China from right. Shanghai, the American flu, and I was on Broadway the night before it closed in New York. So. <laughs> How I'm safe somehow, I had, uh, I, I thought, surely I've got the antibodies. So I, right. I tested that, but I'm negative to all. So I'm, that's great. I'm fortunate. Well, you are fortunate. You're actually fortunate because uh, you uh, shut down your restaurants recently. Um, uh, Flora Cafe was shut down, and uh, uh-huh. which was disappointing, but you couldn't have timed that any better. I said I would like to claim brilliance, but I, it's more like dumb luck. Right. Uh, but but I, I certainly daily thank God I did that. <laughs> now, well, so, what exactly was the reason behind that? Well, uh, thirty-two years of reasons. Right. Um, you know, it was just to the point. Of basically, I'd lost the passion. Um, you know, I, I had lost a business partner after twenty years, and kind of tried to replace him. It was never the same. And I thought, you know, it's just it's just not fun anymore. And by that time I had already developed so many license agreements and so many fun things, great travels that I thought, do I really want to be working this hard at this age? I felt like it was, I was working as hard as I was in the eighties and without the restaurant, I would probably, I I had to do the little equation. I thought, okay, if I close the restaurant, I will work probably 50% less time at least and make more money. So, you know, exactly. there, there was the answer. That, that's a good answer. I've seen when you're uh, in work mode, and it's a different scene piles than the guy who's glad handing his guests and such. Uh, you're, you're like just, just totally focused, and um, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad you're, you're probably glad to release that uh, yes. from your whole psyche. Um, so uh, tell us about the uh, travel situation you're in. Um, you're 
you're doing culinary tours around the world? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I really want to focus on. Of course, that's gone to hell in the handbag right now. Right. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I had four trips this year. Uh, got the one, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia on the river cruise and, and uh, China. We did that in January. That was the last one. It supposed to be in, was supposed to be getting on a boat today, actually, or yesterday oh, wow. uh, in Portugal. Uh, we're going to do the, we're doing river cruises and uh, work with Silver Sea. Uh, so ocean cruises, we're supposed to be in the Mediterranean in July, Rome to Barcelona. Um, and then we have in some land packages we're doing, we were supposed to be doing uh, Morocco in November. So all those cancel, but that's okay. Um, things happen. So our next, but, but we will do probably four a year. And um, I'm going to get No Kid Hungry involved, I believe, which is my charitable uh, a group. We're gonna right. use you, you actually started that, didn't you? Or yes. Was? Yeah, I was, yeah. I was on the founding board member of Share Our Strength. Sure was. And so um, our next big trip we plan, I can't imagine this won't happen, will be next uh, April. We're going to do uh, a trip to the Amazon. I want to do three or four days in Lima, a real culinary adventure. And, uh, and then go to Machu Picchu and then to an Amazon river cruise. That just sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. how, how do people uh, sign up for one of those? Well, uh, they, can, they can check my website. Uh, I'm also in partnership with David Morris International, big travel group. Um, and so, but you can go to stephenpiles.com and see what's, see what's happening. Okay, real good. We'll put those uh, links up uh, at the end of the show. Um, okay, real good. Uh, so you have a storied history, a, a fantastic history of, uh, in the culinary world. Uh, you started the Southwest Food Movement with uh, your group of five, which is just a tremendous story. I'm sure everybody's heard mm -hmm. that, but um, I don't know if you want to touch on it a little bit, maybe? Well, uh, I could. Let's see, this was um, early 80s, and I first opened Roost Street Cafe. My first, kind of, was kind of ground zero for Southwestern. We didn't even know what to call it. We just knew we were doing something uh, something different, something of the region. It's, uh, you know, my background was in French cuisine. I worked right. with Julia Child and uh, the Trois Gros brothers and Michel Girard and a bunch of uh, Paul, Go Paul Bocuse. So French chefs of, the, of that day, Michelin three-star chefs. And so that was my training, but I, all, but you know, I'm a fifth generation Texan. So I always kind of, you know, was a, uh, a, a closet Texan cook. Right. How do you make <laughs> that work? Slipping right? in the chilies into food and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, smoked meat and all that. So um, it just sort of transpired that before I knew it, I was cooking this sort of uh, fancy cuisine of the Southwest. So uh, we didn't even have a name for it at that time, but uh, it soon developed. The press named it. And, you know, it. we, we rode that for two decades. And it's, right. it's really become very important. Uh, it's not so much uh, important today as Southwestern cuisine, but what Southwestern cuisine has done to the kind of uh, uh, overall food scene in America. I mean, it's hard to imagine food today in America. First of all, we, we gave America spice, you know, once you wake people up, they never go back to sleep with flavors. Right. And, uh, and, and, but it's a hard to imagine any kind of food anywhere in America without you know, smoke meat without uh, uh, the techniques of smoking and grilling and, um, you know, cilantro and chilies and, and the things that really, uh, you know, tacos, tamales, enchiladas of some kind, corn masa, all that, that really was, uh, that really was uh, a result of, uh, of Southwestern cuisine. Yeah, we couldn't go to Kroger today and get a, a cilantro or a chilies uh, had that not happened. Right, there, yes. that was a specialty store. Right, well I opened a restaurant in Minnesota, in Minneapolis in 87, 1987, uh, called Tejas, a Southwestern restaurant, and people did not get, first of all, they called it Tejas, T-E-J-A-S, <laughs> Tejas instead of Tejas. And, uh, and it was really hard to get anything uh, of that ilk. You think it is today? Absolutely not. You can yeah, find all that stuff anywhere in any 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 middle any middle American town. Right. You're shipping it from California. Uh, in the beginning. Yes. Well, in the beginning, I was a Root Street Cafe. Uh, I said I, I had to I had to to import all my specialty produce, 
and so guess what specialty produce was back then? Red <laughs> and yellow bell peppers. Wow. Ooh. Yeah, you had to import red and yellow bell <laughs> So it's, it's, and fresh veg, you know, little miniature vegetables, uh, young right. vegetables, all that. Fresh herbs, that was a, you know, you didn't find that here. So That's it's incredible. a different day. It's a different day. That's incredible. Certainly a pioneer. Well, I'm, I'm certainly thankful for that. Um, there's not a day goes by that I'm not putting a chili into something. So it's, that's a <laughs> de rigor with me. Um, so you've had a, a lot of, um, a lot of fantastic dinners throughout your life. You traveled quite a bit. Um, you've had, did you have dinner with the queen? Uh, I prepared lunch for the queen. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. She came to and Dallas. So she came to Dallas. Um, Oh my goodness, I couldn't tell you the year now, but it had to be the late 80s. Uh, and uh, I prepared lunch for her at uh, the Hall of State here in Dallas. That's fantastic. Oh, I love Hall of course, State. she didn't eat. I got to, I got to bow and, and shake her hand. But uh, <laughs> the queen does not eat in public. It's not very queen-like. So <laughs> she was just there. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, so there's some other famous people that we, you've mentioned uh, recently that you've been with. Um, can you name drop some? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, Mikhail, Miguel Gorbachev, uh, uh, five American presidents, six first ladies, um, movie stars, yeah, I don't know, Mick Jagger, Madonna, Cher, on and on. Um, the Duke of Devonshire. <laughs> oh, there you go. That was recent, um, wasn't it? Huh? Yeah, that was just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I, I met him at uh, his castle in... Uh, in Ireland. Right. Um, and who else? Oh my goodness. Just anybody you can imagine. Well, I guess we can narrow it down by saying who was your favorite or can you do that? Uh, yeah. Cindy <laughs> Crawford. Oh, why is that? Because uh, she was so nice, so sweet and so really? engaging and just, you know, wanted me to sit with her and talk and, and she's not bad to look at either. No. <laughs> <laughs> what did what did you prepare for Cindy Crawford, Chef? You know, uh, I think she had fish. She had uh, bronzini with um, Israeli couscous and vanilla scented uh, uh, vanilla scented fennel. I bet she smells like vanilla scented fennel. Yeah, she kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really good. Okay, so I remember one time you told me a story about. Um, Julia Child. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you lots of Julia stories. <laughs> I'd like to hear a couple. That'd be nice. Well, uh, well, first of all, I just love the lady. We we were we hit it off immediately. <clears throat> I was scared to death. She was the first. Uh, I really got my start at the Great Chefs of France cooking school at the Robert Mondavi Winery in the early '80s, and it just dumb luck that I was even an assistant to these great chefs. And the first chef I was supposed to uh, assist was Julia Child. Well, I was just nervous as hell right. and so uh but she turned out to be just obviously a lovely lady um and so we were good friends you know for the remainder of her life which was 20 20 or so years so many good stories let's see she came into um oh i know one we we were at uh norman van akins and i were uh cooking at the uh, Fetzer Vineyards for a food, food and wine festival. She was kind of the top draw, and there was they had, they had put together regional chefs like uh, Miami and Texas were doing a course, and, or Florida and Texas, and then California, New York, and so but it, it was a fun dinner. And so we had uh, you know stayed up all night dissecting the world and drinking lots of wine and right. kind of hung over the next day and had to be in the vineyards at like seven o'clock in the morning to do uh, a remote broadcast of the Narcy David show from San Francisco and so we're kind of stumbling around looking for coffee and we go over and we 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 find the the the, the the television the radio show and there's julia she's already she's on before us and she's got a big coffee mug and she's drinking out of it and i said oh look she's got coffee so they go go to break and we're on next and i said julia where'd you get the coffee and she she called everybody dairy that she liked and she said dairy we're in the middle of a vineyard this isn't coffee it's gewurztraminer <laughs> 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 That's great. 
I actually loved her. Um, I've met her like maybe three times at book signings. Uh, I had a chance to interview her for about five minutes once, but uh, sweet woman. Just very, very yeah. sweet. Yeah, she really, and she, anytime she would come to my restaurant, she would come back in the kitchen and engage my cooks you know, for minutes at a time, just, you know, now, how did you get your start? And I mean, she really was an endearing woman. You know, it was uh, interesting. Uh, we did a, she came to Star Canyon and I had, and she was in town for one of her books, I think the um, baking, baking with Julia. And uh, I said, she'd gone to lunch. She was having dinner with me and she'd gone to lunch. And I said, how was your lunch? She goes, and I'm not telling you where it was, but she said, um, well, it was okay. It was all those grains and berries. I wasn't crazy about <laughs> it. And I said, she said, what are you having for dinner? And I said, well, lots of things. Foie gras tamales for one thing. She that, said, there you oh, go. Good. With lots of butter, I hope. And so <laughs> she came back into the kitchen after the tamale course. There was a five course dinner. And she said, Stephen, that tamale was a triumph. <laughs> and so all the line cooks who had gone from using the word bitchin, you know, if something was really good, it was either right. rockin' or bitchin' back in the 80s. And so everything that was bitchin' now became a triumph. <laughs> 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 Changed the vocabulary. That's incredible. I, I am a big fan of a, a foie gras, so I would love to try those tamales. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Yeah. Uh, maybe someday. You, know, you have a tamale book, in fact. Um, I do. That's a a good Bible for me. Um, there's a couple of things you've written that uh, I've had a hard time with because I just am not, I don't have your hands mm -hmm. in your mind, but uh, yeah. are pretty incredible. Tamales being one of them. Uh, I'm pretty good at tamales, but nothing like you do. They're not as pretty as yours uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And then uh, your, uh, your, the crab uh, tart. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that, that's, well, they're not, they're not easy dishes, but then, um, you know, uh, chefs are like that. <laughs> and so, uh, people ask me, um, that I, after, after I heard three or four times after I published my first book, they said, wow, I got your book. I took it home. It took me all weekend to make that damn meal from blah, blah, blah. And I saw so finally, finally I learned to say, you know, the, the, the best thing to make from my book, don't you? And they'd say, what? And I'd say, reservations there you go <laughs> <laughs> let me cook i think that's uh, that's something we learned from from a uh, great chef's books is that um we have the recipe if you ask a chef a recipe they'll give it to you most times right. yeah, yeah and uh but you know <laughs> pulling it off is another thing altogether that's right that that, that tamale tart uh was just uh, i just couldn't do it i tried so for many years i tried i think i asked yeah. you one time about that too and you're gonna uh, we're going to get together and do that sometime. Maybe we can still do that. But you you changed the tamale tart towards the end. Uh, uh, it, and, became, it, it became the tamale tart 2.0 for Floor Street Cafe. We did the lobster tamale pie. Yeah, that so was delicious. Was, yeah, that was good. That, that's, that was a keeper. We, that was the one uh, item that stayed on the menu the entire time we were open. And there's so much involved in that, too. It was like uh, lobster and, and um, just so much. Uh, they had caviar. And, uh, yeah, it had, uh, started with a little, uh, you know, we made our own masa from, from uh, um, uh, nixtamal, we nixtamalized corn, made our own tamale masa. So it had a little ball of, of that in the bottom and then uh, a smoked uh, corn custard on top right. of that that was steamed and then the buttered uh, lobster on top and caviar and, and a, um, a little, what we called ancho glass on top, which was... Right. Uh, uh, made from isomalt, but with ancho chili. So you crack through it. It looked uh, it's very artistic. And then we would do little designs on top of that with fresh herbs and more caviar and pickled corn, that sort of thing. It was absolutely fantastic um, and beautiful too. Uh, what was your favorite dish you've uh, made throughout the history of Stephen Piles? Well, I don't know that I have a favorite dish. I will tell you the favorite dish of my of my guests and that have been what I'm most famous for the tamale tart um, uh, cowboy ribeye with red chili onion rings I wish to hell I had I had uh, I had uh, coined or uh, trademarked uh, that right. name cowboy ribeye because it has become uh, a cut of meat now but I did that at Star Canyon so cowboy ribeye with red chili onion rings now that followed you around uh, through all the concepts didn't it yeah and uh, the, the original Southwestern Caesar salad with, uh, 
with uh, jalapeno polenta croutons. That's the, that's becoming famous. And when I do license agreements, they all they all want that one. And uh, and then the heaven and hell cake. The heaven and hell cake was interesting. I um, uh, that one I did trademark. It was uh, <laughs> because because one Christmas after after I you know created this cake, Neiman Marcus came to me and said we want to put this cake in our Christmas catalog. And I said, "Oh well, that'd be nice." They said, "Not only is it, um, not only is it a great cake, but it's a good marketing. It's a great name because it's yeah. heaven and hell because angel food and devil's food, and right. as we say, uh, sandwiched uh, by uh, w- with a uh, uh, peanut butter mousse, which we call peanut butter purgatory, and then uh, and then this uh, beautiful chocolate ganache." So anyway, so they said, "Yeah, it's a great name." So I immediately went out and had it trademarked. But they said, so I said, well, how many, um, how many cakes will you sell? And I said, oh, five, 10,000. I thought, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. You, you'll have it. somebody do it. They'll drop ship it. You'll, you'll approve of the recipe and it'll be done elsewhere. So oh, that's that cool. was fun. It was a fun, it was a fun how many, Christmas. How many did you sell? I think 10 to 8,000. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot of cake. Yeah, that's a lot of cake. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so nice. I, I'm so glad having you on the show today. Um, is there a, a restaurant in Dallas that you uh, that you frequent? Uh, I don't frequent anything right now, as you know. Right. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> but when I did, uh, you know, Miko lives in my building. I love his. I love his Mexican food, Miko Rodriguez. Right. So, um, and uh, you know. I love Homewood, Matt's place. Uh, um, Matt McCoster. I, I hope these places reopen. I know he is, but I just, who knows what's going to happen. You know, I was, I was really kind of surprised to hear that Wolfgang had, had decided not to reopen 560. That, that was heartbreaking. Um, that was heartbreaking because it was just such a great place to go celebrate. I, even when it was on Tari's and terrible, I would go up there once every few years to celebrate a birthday with somebody just because right. of that great view. And so for the fact that the food was good now, it was like, wow. But anyway, so it, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough few years. You know, there's everybody's guessing what the number is. Is it 25%? Is it 50%? Who's, who's not coming back? You know? So I was uh, absolutely shocked and saddened and, and crushed um that harry's in venice is closed it's not reopening i right. mean that 95 years that's, that's so insane that is just it's just terrible and then we're going to see much more of that you know it's in and and when it does change i mean when it does come back it's going to be changed you know right. i remember i remember at 9 11 when when restaurants came back from that it was a whole new day you could not sell foie gras lobster caviar Nobody wanted to do that. It was too indulgent. It was all about home food, about comfort food. And so we're going to see some of that again. It's going to be a completely different dichotomy when we, when we actually come back to this. Right. We're just talking about uh, last segment. We we're talking about Vegas and how Vegas may be bankrupt. And uh, it's yeah. be a sad story because Vegas becomes such a culinary wonderland. Yeah. Um, yeah. That it would be uh, we sad. have for sure a lot of restaurants from there will not come back. Right. Right. Now you have a restaurant or had a, um... I had, I had two restaurants there. I was, uh, I loved that time. Uh, it was, uh, I had uh, star Canyon there, right. which later became Aquinox and that was open for probably 20 years. And then the, the, I, I, I did the first chef driven taqueria in America and it was, um, it was uh, Canyonita, taqueria Canyonita at the shops and galleries at the Venetian hotel that opened in 1999. And um, it was open till the day coronavirus shut shut it down. Right. So will it be coming back or is it shuttered? What's that? Will it be coming back or is it shuttered? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's it's good. not mine so, anymore. I sold it. So. Right. Well, that's lucky you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. Um, uh, are you going to be continuing doing uh, some uh, licensing deals, or is it, are you? Oh yeah. Okay. That's what I'm doing, and that's what's fun. Um, uh, I am talking to a group, and currently in uh, uh, in Arizona, in Scottsdale, for a big hotel. They want to do a southwestern restaurant. 
um, I'm, I'm working currently locally for Fireside Pies. They want to broaden their menu and, and you know, so, uh, and then of course I have the airports, which who knows what, I don't know if those are going to come back, right? you know, and so, but yeah, I'm looking, uh, uh, the most interesting thing that I'm doing right now is Ventana, which is a high rise luxury, um, uh, senior living facility right. uh, with three of my venues and uh, that's been a lot of fun and uh, it's been interesting because uh, there were three restaurants there and they all had to shut down like everywhere else so I'm doing videos for them for the residents in their rooms to kind of keep them entertained and we're sending them packages that they can put together you know kind of like home chef right and so uh, it's it's been interesting but you know just I, I don't want a lot of that that's the thing I, I i enjoy not working 80 hours a week it's been right. nice to, it's been nice to just kind of have the time to read and uh watch tv and play with my dog and you know visit if nothing else but by zoom uh with friends and family and 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 then these travels that's that's uh that's that's my that's going to be my life it was going to be but it'll come back so it will come back we're, keep we're, traveling uh, the world we're excited for you i i live through vicariously uh through our travels it's uh, it's mm-hmm. always been a good time uh you're everywhere i was uh i Paula. was uh, I was in the uh, right before the restaurant closed. I was Christmas time, and somebody said, "Oh, chef, I enjoy following you on Facebook. You said such great adventures." And, and and then he said, "And you know what we say? What's the difference between God and Stephen Piles?" And I thought, "Oh Lord, where's this going?" <laughs> and he said, "God is everywhere. Stephen Piles has already been there." Oh no! <laughs> and got the miles. <laughs> I can't imagine what your mileage is like. It's just that's insane. Uh, I asked Paula. Uh, uh, five million miles. Wow. I've got five million miles. <laughs> I asked Paula uh, Lambert. Uh, she's a good friend of yours uh, and a wonderful cheesemaker in Deep Ellum. Uh, uh, and I asked her one time uh, if I could have her miles. Uh, I was at a dinner at your place one time, and I asked her that, and she says. Honey, I don't have any miles. I spend them all. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You keep those low. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, she's she's a good friend of yours. So um, you guys, dear friend. Feeling... Yeah, we do a lot of travels. About about half of my trips are with her. That's great. She has a good following. I have a good following, and that's what that's what makes it good. And yeah, you guys date back uh, from the beginning, don't you? Yeah, since eighty uh, three. She came into my restaurant just after I'd opened. I didn't know who the hell she was. And she said, I'm just back from Italy. And I, I miss, I was there 10 years. I miss my mozzarella and I learned how to make it. And would you buy it? And I tasted <laughs> it. And it was pretty good. But you know what I really want is goat cheese. She says, well, I don't have any goats. And I said, well, go find some. <laughs> That's what I want because the only the only place to get goat cheese at that time was in America, and I was using all American products. I was determined I was going to use all American products, all American wine lists. That uh, people said you're going to fail with those expensive restaurants. Of course, it won all kind of awards, but nonetheless. Um, so uh, the only goat cheese was from uh, Sonoma Valley, uh, Laura Chanel. So anyway, so I didn't think I'd ever hear from her again. And about three months later, she shows up. She's well, I found goats and had this goat cheese and I tasted it. It was great. And I don't remember this, but she says that I said, I looked at her and I said, is this legal? Like she had made it in her bathtub or something. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't That's remember funny. that. But uh, anyway, my- yeah. So we went on to make several cheeses together and just became dear friends. She's probably my best friend. She is, she is so sweet. And I'm so happy for her, all of her travels and her uh, the love she shows for the the cheese, it's just amazing. I'm my she's Paula, an absolute Dallas icon. Yeah, she is. She has a wonderful she's a, accent. She's an American icon. She is. Uh, I remember my first dealing with uh, Paula. I was a uh, young teen, and uh, she was at the farmer's market, and she was on a card table, and she had a little uh, igloo ice chest behind her, and she was selling mozzarella. And yeah. I'd go there, and my mom would take me up to she's the farmer's market. still doing it today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not far from there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my mom would take me up there and she'd go wander around shop and, and I would sit at her feet and just listen to her stories. And I was just amazed by them all. I mean, just, just yeah. I, my, my jaws dropped and 
I wanted yeah. to make cheese and I did eventually make cheese and I'm uh, pretty good at mozzarella. Uh, I'll put yeah. it that way, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, she's a wonderful woman. Wonderful woman. Yeah. Both are fantastic. Uh, well, well it's, it's getting to be the end of our show, um, okay. our segment. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about today? Anything coming up? Um, no, you know, it's kind of a weird, uneventful time, uh, no. but, but I'm kind of liking it. It's weird, you know, cause I just like, I can be just focused on things that I've always wanted to do. You know, I'm getting to read a lot of books that I hadn't read and, and right. watch TV. I've never watched TV. I mean, I don't my watch God, I've watched it watched all these series on netflix it's been fun <laughs> yeah it is fun and i think no, the, but, the world's gonna be different when we come back um yeah yeah absolutely so and it's going to be a different world so we'll have to adapt to that but but you know it's a challenge it's not you know it, it'll it'll be it'll be good um so I, I'm, I'm interested in you know more of my culinary aspects the 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 travels the um uh, the license agreements. It's, it's going to be fun. It's all going to just, I'm, I'm not pushing it. What's nice now is that I don't have to have an agenda. I just right. let it unroll. It comes to me and I say yes or no. It's, right. it's very nice. You live a very charmed life. We should all be so lucky. I do. I'm very yeah. lucky. Well, congratulations for that. I hope you come on our show again. Uh, I, would, this, I would love to. Well, we'd love to have you. And uh, I, I know you were just, just chock full of stories. I know I've, I've been to your restaurant before times and you come by and you talk and, and uh, just tell us what happened that week. You're all excited about oh, it. And, oh, one thing I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm writing my memoirs. Are you really? So I've got lots of stories, four decades in Dallas and travels around the world. And, and so I've got a, I'm going to have, I'm writing it with a very special person that I can't tell, tell you who it is yet, but they're very well known. So That's it's going to be fun. I love, I love, I love to read it. Uh, when can we expect that? Uh, I think within the next 18 months. That's fantastic. It can't happen fast enough. Good. Yeah, I look forward to it. I'm yeah. sure there could be several volumes uh, with your life. Well, I can't wait to um, critique the critique. Critique the critics. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hope you're I've nice seen me, a few. I've seen a few over the years. They, they come and go, sure. don't they? Yes, they do. <laughs> well, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Last man standing, right? Right. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, you're a delightful guest and a wonderful person and a fantastic chef. Look forward to talking to you again. And uh, good luck with this uh, situation we're in now. But uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Stephen. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Man, that was amazing getting to speak with Stephen Piles. Learned so much from that man. He has such a wealth of culinary wisdom and experience. That was pretty amazing. Uh, I, Man, that, that was wild. Um, Next up here, we have Michelle DeWitt of Front Burner Concepts. I'm sure you've uh, eaten at many of her restaurants. Uh, she has an awesome wine tasting here uh, coming right up. Check this out. Go for it, Michelle. Hi, guys. It's Michelle DeWitt. I know that you probably don't know this yet, but I am a crazy wine enthusiast, and I am a student of wine. I am studying for my level four WSET diploma starting this month and um, it's going to be a big degree some a big goal that I'm looking forward to and I'm just crazy about wine so thank you so much for asking me to be on today um, you probably know me a little bit better by the company that my husband and I started 25 years ago uh, front burner restaurants so um, yes those are brands like Haywire, Whiskey Cake, uh, the Ranch in Las Colinas, I declare, what am I forgetting? I'll get in trouble. Whiskey cake, I said, oh, but the one that really launched me into sort of my interest in wine was when we were building 60 Vines. And that's our restaurant in Plano, Texas, that opened in 2016. So um, that's my background. Uh, I thought today what I would do, since it's such a beautiful spring day and we are all in COVID quarantine still, I thought I would talk a little bit about going around the world with Sauvignon Blanc because it's an excellent wine to drink right now. And um, so without further ado, let me show you some of the wines that I picked out yesterday. I'm all about being very, very um, cost conscious actually and pretty down to earth. So all of these wines are under 20. I think um, the last one might be 21. 
But um, anyway, let me just dive in and talk to you a little bit about Sauvignon Blanc. So this is a grape that is grown all over the world. It is usually a cool climate grape and um, it can be uh, grown in some warmer climates. But today we're gonna start with uh, Whitehaven, which is a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough. And um, let's just taste this and see what we think we have going on here. So I have friends that are crazy for this wine, so I wanted to pick this one just to kind of keep, keep us on our toes. So this wine is just right out of the box, just like going nuts out of the glass. It has so much green character, so much cut grass, lemon lime zest. Um, this is like your middle school boyfriend that wore too much cologne, okay? This is straight up geyser, very finely tuned, racing acidity. Um, let's try it on the palate. So right now you can tell, mouth puckering, crazy acidity. And I'm getting that from the sides of my mouth, sides of my tongue. It's almost ripping the enamel off of my teeth, if you will. But um, I know people just love the flavors of this wine. Lemon, lime, zest, cut grass, green, lots of green fruits. Um, to me, the hallmark is just the racing acidity of this wine. You will never forget this. If you are somebody that wants to learn to blind taste, start with Sauvignon Blanc and start from New Zealand. And I'm telling you, you'll be able to pick it out of a crowd. Just like that boy from middle school that had all the cologne on and then you grew to love him, this is your wine, okay? All right, so let's move on. I think it's important to remember that Sauvignon Blanc isn't just a racy, super, super high acid wine. It can have a little more nuance to it. And that being uh, said, I picked this wine from Sancerre. Now this is French and it's from the Loire Valley. And the thing that I love about this wine is it's incredibly balanced. And I found this at Costco. I came skipping home, I had no idea. It was $18.99 and I opened it up, sight unseen, didn't know anything about it. Chateau de Thauvenet. Um, and I sat here and I was just, blown away. Um, so let's taste it on the palate a little bit and I'll tell you a little more about it. So on the nose, just before I get ahead of myself, this, this wine is a lot more nuanced than what you're going to find in New Zealand. This is the wine that kind of says, come here and get a little closer. I need to get to know you a little better. So it's still very juicy, lemon fruit, um, you know, got your green fruits, your apple, a little bit of nectarine, um, but really it's just kind of begging you to take a sip. So let's try that. This is a beautiful wine, very elegant, very balanced. I'm not getting that gushing sense of acidity and yet it's still there. Um, it, this is a wine that I think just knocked my socks off because I thought to myself, this is the guy that comes over, the woman that comes over at a party and maybe you're single and you sit down on the, on the couch together and before you know it, four hours has passed and this is just this wine that gets um, more interesting on the palate and, and just doesn't scare you away, it just pulls you in. So I really, really love this wine from Sancerre and I would really encourage people um, who haven't tried a French Sauvignon Blanc to go here and pick something up. And like I said, it was $18.99 for a bottle. So you could easily, um, I think, enjoy that over the weekend. So, okay, let's move on. The last one I have to try here, we're coming back to the US of A, back to California. This is a Napa Valley Gras, very good producer. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, from Napa Valley, from Oakville, I believe. So um, let's try this on the nose. So right off the bat, a lot of the same green characteristics, yellow, uh, citrus fruits, lime, lemon. Uh, and, and I can already tell for me, it's, it's a little bit hotter of a wine. It's got more alcohol on it. A lot going on here on the nose.
Wow. Ooh, wow. This is, this is a big wine for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I can tell you they did blend in a little bit of Semillon. So it's giving, uh, and I know we don't know that grape yet, but it's frequently done in Bordeaux and, and uh, in, in white Bordeaux, of course, to sort of round out some of that racing acidity that Sauvignon Blanc has. So you get this rounder, richer mouthfeel. This is an over the top white. It is excellent. It is, this is your ladies, this is your James Bond. This is the guy that comes storming into the house, to the movie theater, to your living rooms that has it all going on from oak to malolactic fermentation. It's got that buttery round mouthfeel, a lot of alcohol, a lot of fruit. Um, and for, for the men, this is probably your Angelina Jolie. This is just a, a very sexy, awesome, powerful wine. So I would think that, um, you know, you could serve all three of these. I think it'd be fun to do a dinner party um, and serve all three of these Sauvignon Blancs or do a tasting with your friends and see if they can pick up the differences and see what they like. Uh, it, it has been a joy to be with you. I hope that I get asked back again. And if you want to check out my Instagram, it's at Michelle underscore DeWitt, I think. So um, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, everybody out there, for uh, tuning in to another incredible episode of uh, Crave TV. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, we'll be announcing a special surprise guest uh, during the week. So don't forget to tune in next week. Uh, stay safe, drink a lot of great wine, and have a lot of great food.